The following is brought to you by Vertical Vet. Rethink your GPO. Hello, everybody. I am Dr. Ernie Ward, Executive Director of Education at Vertical Vet, and I am so glad to spend some time with you today. In fact, today we've got a topic that is near and dear to my heart, as most veterinary professionals are out there probably feel the same way, and that is dermatology. But today we're going to dive into that really frustrating element of dermatology called otitis externa, and we have got a fantastic dermatologist today, a good friend of mine, somebody I've known for many, many years, and I just can't wait to introduce him. But again, you know, we're coming to you during this unprecedented time. Many of us have had our lives very much disrupted. We're doing curbside service. We're seeing things that we never saw before in a way that we have never seen them before. And we're also seeing a surge in sick pets. And so we're at that time of year where we're entering into the fall in the Northern Hemisphere, where we know we're about to see an explosion and allergic dermatitis, and with that brings otitis externa. And so today we've got a board certified dermatologist, Dr. Chris Reeder of Lighthouse Allergy and Veterinary Dermatology. He's got several different locations. Uh, Chris is a graduate of Auburn University, which we will not hold that against him just at this time, but he did his residency over in Southern California, beautiful animal dermatology clinics. And if you don't know about those guys, I mean, they kind of were the pioneers in veterinary dermatology. So Chris trained with the best. He has now become one of the most respected and sought after dermatology speakers in the world. And we are thrilled to have him today. So thanks, Chris, for joining us. Yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Good to see you and um, to, to just be able to share all this uh, interesting uh, updated information and knowledge on ear disease and dogs and cats. And uh, hopefully this will uh, give you some things to try out here in the you know next day or two. You bet. And Chris, before we get started today, I mean, how are, how are you guys doing? I mean, I know you've got, uh, I don't know, what, three or four dermatology clinics, but you interface with a lot of veterinarians. Uh, you're in the South, just like me. But I mean, how are you guys doing? Are you busy? Is it stressful? What's going on? Yeah, we, you know, thankfully, we've been, uh, we've been really uh, fortunate to, uh, to see quite a, a, a large number of uh, new cases and uh, recheck cases. And we've kind of gone before, you know, between curbside and uh, in person uh, types of uh, uh, examinations and things, but we've had a, a very uh, good, um, uh, you know, caseload over the last uh, several months. Um, and I think we're all just trying to be safe and uh, make good decisions there. But uh, we're we're very happy to continue uh, care and uh, extend our services to the people that need it. Yeah, that's great to hear, Chris. And and again, you know, when we're looking at this pandemic and the effects that it's having on our economy, on our practices, on our personal lives, I mean, obviously, no one, nothing is unaffected. But the great news is that, by and large, the veterinary industry has been resilient during these times. And Chris, I appreciate you sharing that with me. We're hearing same reports all across the country. Obviously, sick pet visits tend to be up. You know, wellness visits are sort of hit or miss for a lot of clinics, uh, particularly along, right. among felines. And that's something we've been working on greatly. So today, we're going to talk about something that is new near and dear to my heart. Uh, I live in coastal North Carolina, as you know. We're both from the South where heat and humidity just go hand in hand like Sunday dinner. And so for us, we're used to seeing a lot of dogs with infections in their ears. But maybe some of our colleagues, there's a definite seasonality to it. So I'm really excited to, to talk to you about that. But before we get started, just maybe dive into a little bit about the prevalence of otitis externa. I mean, how prevalent is it out there? Is it just us in the South that complain about it? Or is this something that affects most of America? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. We So uh, in the majority of cases that we see with otitis externa in, in dogs and in cats, uh, the, the majority of them are going to be secondary to some underlying problem. And, and that doesn't affect just the, the southern creatures. Uh, you know, we, we see that all over. And I, I've worked, you know, like you said, in Southern California, I've worked in Maryland, I've got, you know, friends all over the Northeast and, and uh, Southwest. And, and it's a problem, you know, everywhere, really. Uh, I, I would say our uh, studies that we've kind of looked at retrospectively in uh, dogs and cats, um, about 80% of cases of allergic skin disease, of atopic dermatitis, or even food allergies, 
will also have concurrent otitis externa. So it's, it is very common um, to see that as a part of that allergic uh, profile that we will have with our dogs and cats. Yeah, and that's a really good point. I mean, obviously your clinic is even named the Allergy and Dermatology Clinics, but you know, the reality is, Chris, I'm like you, you know, this has been one of those frustrating elements of practice where you, know, you see these dogs with chronic seasonal atopy, right? So they're coming in every spring or fall or, or summer or throughout the year, depending on, on where you live. And, and at the same time, they have this concurrent otitis externa. And so about the time you get one of these conditions a little bit under control, and we've had some tremendous advances with uh, dermatitis here in the past few years, some revolutionary uh, therapeutics, as you know. Oh, sure. But then, you know, we wound up being layered and lamb blasted with a, an ear infection. So, you know, as much talk as we have about the advances in treating dermatitis, allergic dermatitis, just the itchy skin component, you know, Chris, we really need to get back to the ear because we will fail our clients and our patients, of course, if we ignore that. Right. No, I mean, absolutely. And, you know, what I find a lot of times is that, you know, dogs and cats, um, probably more so in dogs with allergic skin disease, um, these ears uh, will be um, secondarily inflamed, itchy, um, smelly. Uh, and so there's infection and sometimes not infection that goes with it. And that's one of the things that oftentimes is missed um, is that it's a prequel to seeing uh, infection begin, which is just itchy ears. And you can ear, you know, do an ear cytology and you know, uh, check the ears out, and you might just see inflammation in the ear and absolutely no yeast or bacteria. And those ears go left untreated, but in reality, they do need treatment. And uh, just as much as we would bathe a dog or use wipes on the paws or armpits or whatnot, we also need to be aware of the ears as part of that, um, you know, dog's uh, symptoms and presentation as well. Yeah, Chris, that is a fantastic point. And, and again, you know, Vertical Vet Family, these are the types of, of really concepts we want to make sure to reinforce whether you're a young or seasoned practitioner. I mean, it's important to understand that this is a continuum, right? I mean, the integument of the ear and the skin are largely similar, but the problem of the ears is that it's compounded by usually, as you mentioned, a secondary yeast or bacterial infection. So I, I think that, you know, let's first start off when we talk about the pathogenesis, you know, like what causes these ear infections? And, and maybe we can cover the dermatitis or the allergic dermatitis, uh, component as well as then just going into, you know, some primary and secondary infections. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, the, the, the pathogenesis really has to do with something that's, uh, causing the ear, uh, to be abnormal in the first place. And th that can be due to, uh, a, a primary pathogen uh, like ear mites, for example. Um, you know, we, we don't see probably as much otodectes or, um, even, you know, demodex uh, that, can, that can affect the ear, scabies, uh, those, those uh, parasites, because we have such good new flea and tick preventatives that a lot of dogs and cats are on, the isoxazoline class of compounds that everybody's aware of, the Simperica and Brevecto and Cradelio and uh, Revolution Plus, all those medications are really good. So, but those uh, parasites can affect the ear. You, you know, we see a hormonal diseases occasionally, Cushing's disease, uh, hypothyroidism, uh, that can cause some suppression on the immune response. And so secondary infections develop because of that. Um, but like you had mentioned, and, and we kind of talked a little bit about already, is that we see the primary, one of the most common primary reasons why dogs and cats will develop ear disease um, are not because of tumors or because of polyps or because of uh, of hormonal imbalances, but really a allergic skin disease because it is an extension of the skin down in the ear canal. And so it, it can be just as inflamed as, you know, the back or belly or paws or anywhere else. And, uh, and it's somewhat of a closed system. So it's a unique area, uh, because we do have a lower level of oxygen. We've got different humidity levels in the ears, depending on what breed it might be. Uh, and so those are all um, reasons why the ear could be affected. Uh, it's interesting to me that one of the studies that most people probably would not have seen, which is a journal, a Japanese journal, um, is uh, really uh, interesting. And in I, I wasn't taught this at Auburn, and maybe that's because I went to Auburn. Maybe Georgia had a better <laughs> place uh, 
uh, educational system with dermatology. But we uh, we were taught that if you had floppy ears, you would have a higher humidity level. That just made sense. And so we, you know, for years and years went with the idea that floppy ears caused infections. Um, but not every single basset hound or cocker spaniel has ear disease, contrary to some folks' uh, opinion. And what this uh, article showed is that uh, it, it showed that the uh, relative humidity in German shepherd's ears was actually higher than basset hound's ears. Wow. So kind of interesting in, in that uh, regard. So we know there's more than just the humidity. We know that there's some underlying pathology with this immune response um, down in the ear canal for a lot of these cases that we see that is causing these secondary uh, infections to, to develop. Right. And that's a really good point. I, I am a bit familiar with that paper, but, you know, like, like one of the things they looked at were what, you know, what are the differences in sebum production, for example, amongst different dogs? So, you know, is there differences yeah. in what they're actually producing down in that deep ear canal, you know, the L shape uh, as it. So all those things affect, you know, those micro environments down there. So obviously anatomy, humidity, and so forth. Now, Chris, when we couple that with painful swelling, now now we've really got a chokehold at that L, so to speak. So explain a little bit about how inflammation really is a, a risk factor, if you will, for subsequent infection. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, so when, whenever we have two things that inflammation really um, causes is that it, it'll produce more uh, sebum, it'll produce more glandular exudate, for yeast and bacteria to colonize. And then the other problem with it is that over time, not only does that material compound upon itself, um, but the swelling in the canal itself, uh, that tissue swelling, will not allow normal evacuation of bacterial containing clumps of earwax and hair and those things. And uh, you know, there's there's no little, uh, 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 you know, like Fraggle Rock, the little dozers and diggers that are digging that stuff out of the ear. There's nothing like that. It's just the, the cells will shed like shingles on a roof. But if there's a, a speed bump, they, they can't quite get over that speed bump to get out. And so it just compounds. And then we start to see ceruminoliths. We start to see these rock hard uh, balls of wax that are loaded, just chock full of organisms, and they are a reservoir, no matter how much you can clean, in some cases, for infection. Right. And again, you know, Chris, maybe speak a little bit about the normal bacterial and fungal inhabitants. I mean, because I think sometimes people think, well, they must have gotten the infection from somewhere, right? You know, right. contaminated water or who knows? I mean, we, we hear a lot of these, but, but speak to, you know, hey, a lot of these organisms are natural inhabitants of the microbiome, if you will, of the year. Right, exactly. So, you know, we know that there's uh, ears just like skin or, you know, uh, skin on the haired areas of the body uh, and the paws, this is an open system. <clears throat> it's not a closed system. And so, <clears throat> you know, when we talk about actually sampling these areas, we expect to see some level of bacteria and, and yeast. And there's normal populations of Malassezia, of staph, of uh, e even E. coli and Pseudomonas. We can see these organisms present in small populations um, and, uh, it, it's not surprising because it's, we're open to the environment around us. Um, but the immune response of a normal individual should be able to capture those bacteria and yeast organisms, present that to the immune, res immune system of the skin and be able to then cancel those out. So there's not an actual infection. What we know about dogs in particular with atopic dermatitis is that their skin immune function, and everybody's key phrase here in the last probably, I don't know, five or eight years, has been something uh, to the effect of this helps your skin barrier, you know? And so that, that skin barrier is, is compromised. And because of that and the skin immune function being somewhat suppressed in these cases, that's where those normal 
organisms will become pathogenic. Right. So again, it's just it's a culmination of the right factors. I mean, the players are already on the field. It's just now we got to blow the whistle to let it go. And in this case, it's either going to be an allergic condition, immunocompromise, a secondary infection or trauma. I mean, things like that. So, you know, the one other thing, too, that I think it's important when we're educating clients, you know, because, again, Chris, if, if your clients are anything like mine, they're looking for they're going to become pet detectives. Like, where did my dog get this infection? Right. You know right. I mean, it's like, right. hey, it, it just happened because of, of the allergies or whatever. And they don't like yeah. that. They want to go back to the dog park and there was that little schnauzer that licked him in the ear, right? But but I think it's also important to note that it is normal and healthy and probably even necessary for us to have malassezia as a normal inhabitant of the ear because what that's also doing is priming the immune system. So if you lived in a completely sterile world, you know, right. it would it, we would not be able to combat these just common in, invaders or whatever. So when your clients are coming back and saying, you know, I don't know where my dog got this ear infection. He hasn't been swimming in any ponds. He hasn't been licked by a schnauzer at the park. I mean, it's really important for us to explain to them that, no, this is actually due to potential Potentially, you know, damage to this immune barrier, you know, to compromise of the immune system from an allergy, a secondary trauma. I mean, right, Chris, because I, I think too often we do take the easy route as veterinary professionals and go, oh, yeah, right. who knows what happened at the dog park when in reality oh, yeah. we need to have that allergy talk, in my opinion. Right. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And, you know, I, I get this question quite frequently. And, um, you know, um, one of the things that I highlight with folks is something called the hygiene hypothesis, right. which you just kind of alluded to there, which is essentially, you know, saying, hey, the, the cleaner the environment that we're in, the more likely you are to, as an infant uh, with your immune response, to develop a pro-allergic, you know, and you can fill in the blank, pathway right to all these other conditions, which is one reason why we're seeing more allergic animals than we have before. It's that, maybe surveillance, maybe people are just taking better care of their animals. But you're absolutely right. that They're not picking up uh, Fluffy's, you know, salivary bacteria, and then that's causing it. It's, it's normally there. They're supposed to have it. And as you said, these bacteria and yeast, actually, it's sort of like having a house on a piece of real estate you know, you can't put another house there. There's already something there. So, you you know, it's already developed. You're not going to, you know, necessarily tear it down and put something else there. It, it's there. It's a protective mechanism. One of the wipes that we use actually is made from, it's, it's a, a, now it's actually more readily available, but they were cattle and uh, uh, sheep and goat dairy wipes. Yep. Um, and they were made from lactobacillus lacti, which is a bacterium on the actual mammary tissue that prevents other bacteria be to become an infection. So it's a perfect example of why we need those there. Um, no different than bacteria in our gut. You know, people will say, why do you take yogurt or probiotics or whatever? Well, that's bacteria. We're just eating it. So you're uh, it's healthy bacteria. So yeah. there, there is a certain level of that that's on the skin and in the ears. And so, you know, Mrs. Smith doesn't have to worry about this coming from her terrible neighbor next door's dog. Uh, <laughs> it's it's just there already. So. It is brilliant. And again, you know, Vertical Fat Family, if if uh, he he hinted at something, go, go back and study your history of smallpox. It's fascinating. Remember the milkmaids, how they had immunity against smallpox, which is really where a lot of that's the whole vaccine sort of originated. So again, fascinating study here. But let's get back to real world. You know, what about ear cleaning? Because this has got to be one of the hottest topics out there. Everybody's got an ear cleaner. I mean, there's doctor this and doctor that and, you know, right. healing this. So so can you just cut through the noise on, on what we need to know about ear cleaning and dogs and cats? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, it, sending home ear cleaners, I think, is is great um, to be able to do that. Uh, I, I find that many of the, the micellar type cleansers and the cleansers that are adjusting for pH levels um, and supporting that skin, like I said, that immune function, that skin barrier is really kind of what we're looking for. So um, there's a few products out there that, that do that pretty well, in my opinion. Um, you know, one that we use fairly commonly in the clinic, which you probably have used as well, is the Epiotic Advanced. And so we've got that skin barrier function. We've got that technology to help support that. We've got, you know, a cleaning agent that is a, a pH balance solution that helps remove the wax and debris. 
and then has some residual activity. So that's kind of what we're looking for. Um, it It is difficult, I will say, in many situations where there's chronic ear disease to flush the ears at home or in an awake animal type situation. So many of those, you know, unfortunately they do require anesthesia or sedation to do a thorough cleaning. Um, whether you do or don't have video otoscopy is not, you don't have to have that. Honestly, you can make things uh, as simple as a red rubber catheter attached to a 6 ml syringe and flush the ear if you don't have a you know, very expensive video otoscopy unit. Um, but there's a, a lot of good in cleaning the ears. I typically, when I send home a cleaner, would recommend no more than about twice a week because we know that overcleaning right. can lead to some of the disruption in the ear's natural ability to uh, exit some of the wax and debris, you know, from the ear. But a lot of these cases do need to have especially chronic cases, uh, more of an in-house sedated <clears throat> anesthetic type of ear flushing um, to be done. Yeah, I'm really glad you said that, Chris. Uh, it's always nice to have, you know, sort of general practice validated by, you know, specialists like yourself, because I do, I agree with you 100%, especially in these chronic cases, these, these cockers with the cobblestones down in their ears, you know, and the cobblestoning effect is just how, uh, you know, I describe it, but you know, there's yeah. really, they're narrow. Uh, you're not going to be able to send Mrs. Smith home with a bottle of ear cleaner, even if it's exotic, you know, and, um, and, and have any, any real results. You're going to have to get down in there, get that initial cleaning. I also like the fact that you reinforce what a lot of us have been trying to emphasize to practitioners for years is that less frequent is probably better, right? Because we do have these clients that say, I'm going to do it twice a day. And that's probably causing more harm than good. Uh, would you speak on that? I mean, you, we do have those clients, right? Who are like insisting, like, I want to clean them, you know, once a day or whatever. And I, I try to discourage them in many cases. Right. No, I mean, cleaning the ear excessively can actually do harm to the canal. It can cause more inflammation. It can cause more irritation. Uh, we actually, because of that, can see more buildup. So it's it's almost like the more that you wash your car, you know, the dirtier it becomes kind of thing, which is really a little bit strange. But we, we see that in the ear because it does produce a little bit more wax and debris and things when you clean it very frequently. I'm more of a fan of treatment. Um, on a, a daily or twice a day basis and maybe a once a week ear cleaning. Honestly, that's what right. I do with most of my cases because it'll help to remove a lot of that. Right. And let's get now. This is where really the nitty gritty for the vertical vet members comes into play because you know, we want to know about the therapeutics, some of the newer things, what you're recommending. I think we made a good case for the pathogenesis, talking about other concurrent conditions or underlying risk factors. You know, we've talked about cleaning, maybe do it you know, a couple of times a week. It's probably great after hopefully, you know, a really thorough, deep cleaning done under anesthesia. But now let's get to therapeutics because that's something that we're going to have to do on a daily basis. So give us some tips and your best best advice yeah so you know we've got really you you have a few different options when it comes to therapy um you know we, we've got the um ear packs which have gained a tremendous amount of popularity and i i don't uh, dismiss those especially for the very difficult dogs or cats and, and Chris, um, just what, for some people that maybe they're younger veterinarians when we say ear packs describe we're talking about you know putting something into the ear maybe describe that that process real quick right so these are these are products that are typically in a uh, uh, a a lanolin type base it's a thicker wax type material that's uh, put into the ear canal uh, with a usually a syringe and uh, in it it remains in the ear for a certain duration and that may be a couple of weeks it may be a month um, those products are usually actually they're all compounded right and so they have usually a steroid uh, a, an antihist or an antibiotic and an antifungal and um, what I see with those products um, and I see a lot of ear issues is that uh, the two problems I see with it <clears throat> is they don't tend to kill bacteria or yeast very well. And my thought is it tends to, um, to chelate, to actually bind some of those <clears throat> antibiotic or antifungal uh, medications in that product. It tends to work fairly well for inflammation. So it reduces inflammation in, right. in a 
number of them. Um, but it's also very hard to remove. So if you do have a compromised eardrum, which is fairly common in a lot of these cases, it's hard to flush it out of the middle ear. And that's, I think, among dermatologists, you'll probably hear that. It's just a thicker paste type material. It's hard to get out. Yeah. And that's a really good point. You know, they, these things sort of have, have waxed and waned in popularity over the years. You know, I'm, I'm a little bit older than you, Chris. So I've seen them when it first came out and we were packing them with cotton balls, you know, and, and it was a good idea at first. And I think there are some cases that lend themselves to this type of sort of immediate short-term acute treatment. But, you know, I think that then we kind of went as we do in most things in medicine to the extreme usage you know, where every dog started getting packed. And then, you know, I think we kind of cooled off, but you're seeing, you're still seeing this uh, out there. Yes. Yeah. We're, we're still seeing it quite a bit of it uh, being used. And, and I think it's a convenience factor. Yeah, I mean, it's, sure. it's, it's the, uh, it's the depo uh, medrol or right. convenia and, and there's nothing wrong with those, but <clears throat> not every case is going to respond to it, you know? Well, so. well, let me just, let's just jump in there because there are really two, well, there's, there's two major components of treatment here that I want to address. Uh, one is anti-inflammatory and I want to speak to that in just a second. And the other is of course, you know, anti-infective. So whether it's fungal or bacterial, but right. first of all, let's talk about the anti-inflammatory component because this is where I do uh, have strong opinions like most veterinarians of my age. Uh, and that is, you know, the pain element. These people typically are coming to us because they they feel their dog is suffering. They've watched it miss, you know, sleeping. You know, it's just clawing, you know, bloody red. I mean, you know the story. We all have seen sure. the pictures. But so so let's first of all talk about what, what do you like and when do you use anti-inflammatory agents in those ears? Yeah, my, my you know, my cutoff really is whenever you've got at least, you know, 30 or 40 percent stenosis in the ear when the ear is just swelling to a point where you can't really get meds in very well. And then the other, the other part is, I mean, if the dog's in pain, you know, I mean, if, if you flip over the ear pinna and that, that animal is trying to bite or scream or quickly move away from you, it's, it's probably in pain. I tend to just use prednisone. I mean, honestly, I, I, I am a believer in somewhere between honestly, like one to two mgs per kg daily and uh, taper it, you know, fairly quickly. The ear packs tend to be in those dogs that are, that are painful and they were used um, for a lot of that, uh, the, that reason is that they can't, the owner couldn't put medication right. in the ear. So what else do you do? Right. And so I usually challenge people that if the dog's painful uh, and, you know, won't accept ear medicine, put it on steroids, put on prednisone for a week have them come back, yeah. and I would almost guarantee you that that dog, unless it's aggressive for some other reason, is going to be more accepting of an ear exam and uh, to be able to put medications in at home. Chris, I, I got to tell you, that's just music to my ears. You know, obviously, having been in practice for over 30 years, you know, this is, we learned this the hard way, you know, and I think a lot of, of the people of my, my contemporaries, you know, probably who taught you, quite frankly, you know, we realized that we had to get the pain and inflammation under control first. And so that if that meant putting them on a little prednisone, prednisolone for a few days to calm things down, as we used to say, and then come back on Friday, you know, so be it. I mean, you might give the bacteria or fungi, you know, a couple of days head start on you. But Chris, really, at the end of the day, this is about quality of, of life and, and, you know, and reducing pain. So, so I really appreciate you saying that. So now let's flip on the other side, Okay. I guess I want to ask two questions. Number one, how do you select an anti-infective? So bacterial, fungal, combo. You, how, what are your steps in, in determining what you're going to use? And then what are some of your you know, recommendations for, for those? Yeah, so I, I always perform cytology first. That's, that's like number one. I had a, I had a dog, um, a patient that was seen recently. And, um, you know, it was... Uh, it was uh, uh, the owner uh, commented that the dog didn't have any ear infection because it didn't smell infected. Right. But, you know, so smell doesn't equal microscopic examination. You know, we, we have to take samples and we've got to got to look at those and, and make some choices based on that. Because if it's only yeast, that's going to maybe dictate using a certain product. If it's only cocci, if it's a combination where it's rods and cocci and yeast, um, many times I'll culture ears. I'm a fan of that. 
uh, there's some folks who are not fans of culturing ears because the, you know, the level of bacterial uh, solution topically is going to be different than plasma concentrations, which are what most cultures are going to report as far as the MIC or the minimum inhibitory concentration. So uh, I like it because it does give me some additional insight into what we have brewing in the ear. Um, it's a If it's a first time case, there's many products <clears throat> that you can use. I mean, they're all, like you said, there's, God, there's just numerous products out there. Too many, really. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a ton of them. So I, I like, I like trying to use products that make sense as far as the stenosis, you know, how, how liquidy it is, um, the comfort of application, you know, as an owner actually going to be able to count the drops from a nozzle, you know, you know, one of these guys here, or is the owner going to put something in the ear that's going to be more of a flexible tip and, you know, one pump, two pumps, and then you're, you're done. Are you going to, or do you, do you send home syringes with the owner? I mean, everybody's kind of different in how they, so that's really my choice in medication is it has to do with number one, cytology, <clears throat> number two, the amount of stenosis that the, that the ear has, because if I can't get a really thick ointment in the ear, it's not going to be effective. It's not going to go where it needs to be. And then three, uh, usually culture, um, because I see the chronic ones, you right. know, you, Right. Those, those are the ones I use. So, so those let me, medications. Let me just, this is what, I hear this all the time, and I really want to speak to some of those younger graduates who aren't as confident behind the microscope. I mean, you know, look, when I graduated in 1992, we didn't have access to labs. And it, when we did, you know, it took days to get results back. So we really honed our microscopic skills, right? Um, but speak to them. I mean, because one of the common complaints I get is, you know, they say, well, these younger vets, they don't feel comfortable like making a diagnosis under the microscope. They want to send the slides off for everything. I mean, can you can you speak to that? What can we do to help them feel more comfortable driving those slides and saying, hey, I'm seeing cocci here, you know, I'm seeing rods, I'm seeing gram negative positive, whatever it may be, you know, how, what can we do to help? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of good resources that are available. Um, you know, we, we've got uh, you know, dermatology textbooks that uh, certainly can be helpful as far as, you know, cytologic evaluation. Uh, there are, uh, you know, a number of different atlases now that have cytology, good photos and things. Uh, what the best way to do it is just get in there and take the samples and stain the slides and look at them. Yeah. I mean, honestly, that's the absolute best way to do it. Um, you know, and, you know, if you want, we can look at a couple of photos here and show you some sure. images if you're interested. Um kind of look through some of these and, and just kind of show you briefly, you know, what we're looking at. And that way, yeah. you know, it, it gives you some representation at least of as far as that goes. Okay, we got your slides up. Let's see here. And I, I really just, I really appreciate you kind of giving permission to some of these younger vets as a specialist, because, you know, this is a skill that I think is essential for being a good practitioner, especially a, a generalized uh, practitioner. Uh, you know, and, and look, I know my boundaries, like I'm not going to necessarily diagnose, you know, a round cell tumor, but I surely am going to diagnose, you know, a bacterial yeah. ear infection, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, and so when when you're looking at these slides, I mean, basically doing a a, a, a prep with, you know, cotton tipped applicators. I roll mine on a slide and I make an R for right and an L for left. That way, if it's upside down, it won't get read inappropriately. <laughs> right, right. And and you know, it's you know, every vet's different. You know, some say, well, I roll it on this side and then I roll it on this side. That's right on this side and left on this or back and forth wherever. It, I just, I, I, maybe I'm just, you know, again, I went to Auburn, so, and, and uh, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know, I, you know, it, it could be that they just taught things differently, but anyway, we were just simple, I guess, and so I just write R, R for right, L for left, I stain them uh, with Diff Quick, nothing, I don't have any magic dermatology stains, uh, none of us do, right. um, it's just the triple stain that we all have, I like to heat fix mine just for a half a second, um, you don't have to, but I feel like it adheres to this, the glass better. And then I look at them. So here's what we're looking at. I mean, we see, <clears throat> for example, these are just keratinocytes. Yeah. Um, interesting, right? You know, you've got these 
angular cells. You've got some uh, nuclei <clears throat> or nucleus in the middle of this one. And then you've got these little keratohyaline granules. So this is a uh, kind of an interesting cell. Uh, it's a, it, just an immature keratinocyte. Um, but, but you start looking at these and go, oh, those aren't bacteria. Those are <clears throat> keratohyaline granules. Or you start seeing this is one from a cat, for example. Um, and the, these have more rod-shaped granules. Sometimes these granules fall off the cells and you think they're bacteria. And if you stain these and look at them and you don't see any neutrophils or inflammation around them, then you have to look back again and make sure that those are truly bacteria or if they're these granules, whether they're carotohyaline or melanin granules, because oftentimes I get the, the comment of, why did my culture come back negative? Right. Oh, that's because they're not bacteria. So these are normal. And some, of, some will stain, some won't. Um, acantholytic cells, so these fried egg cells, we see these from dogs um, and cats in their pinna. It's a common spot to see pemphigus foliaceus, for example, an autoimmune disease. So it tells us a little bit more about what's happening with the – and again, these are types of keratinocytes. They're just immature, and they're broken apart in a younger stage um, within, the, uh, within the epidermis. And then this is really what we see a lot of times, right? We see yeah. – Right. Lots of neutrophils. We see um, rods. We see all those um, nasty little bugs. And in this in this case, I probably like if I saw this on cytology, I would say we should probably culture this year because, as you know, gram negatives respond kind of differently to medications. They may not be as responsive to <clears throat> a fluoroquinolone or polymyxin B or those other antibiotics. And so that helps us to dictate a little bit better on the, on the treatment. So those are a few, you know, a few little, uh, just indications of kind of what that, you know, what the cytology would look like. And, and it's, it's easy to, um, to just take the slide and, and stain it and take a look at it. It's, it's a, it's really a, a, a little bit of a, learning as you go type of situation, in my opinion. I, I mean, that's yeah. just kind of how it goes. I really, I, I, again, I think it's just so important and incumbent upon us, especially, you know, as my generation X, you know, sort of becomes now the, the, the older generation of, of the profession, so to speak, to, to really, you know, support and nurture these skills. Because, you know, Chris, we hear all the time, you know, while they come out of school and they're afraid to do surgery, you know, heaven forbid they have to do a urolithotomy, right? They're not going to go near, you know, a chest cavity. Um, and, and we really, I don't want to lose that as general practitioners. I understand <laughs> that that is a dying ethos, but you know, the reality is there's so much, uh, joy to be found in, in reading your own slides from time to time. And of course, then knowing when, you know, to, to call you, uh, especially in those chronic cases. And I guess that's where I kind of want to leave today because a lot of, a lot of vertical vet members are out there. They're going, okay, look, Ernie, I got it. You know, I got to handle most of what you guys said today, but when do they refer to you, Chris? When, what are some of the signal months? that you say, hey, you know what? I, I mean, I know you have to get these cases all the time. I wish I had seen them then. What is the then? Yeah. So uh, typical, the typical rule of thumb is if, if you've seen the same dog or cat for the same problem three or more times within about a six-month period, that's a pretty good rule of thumb for a secondary opinion. You know, and, and typically you don't want that secondary opinion to be Mrs. Smith leaving your practice to go to somebody else's practice a block away. You want it to be, hey, I've got this colleague of mine. Let me let me let you talk to them. Maybe just get an evaluation. They may say the same thing that you're saying, which just supports, you know, everything that you're doing. And it gives them a peace of mind. And that's awesome. Sometimes we see strange stuff. Like I see cases where they may have a thorn and it's just not able to be seen. Maybe it's the equipment. Maybe it just happens to be the angle. Maybe it's another set of eyes. But we've had cases where there'd be a piece of a cotton tipped applicator stuck in the ear canal or some weird foreign body or a polyp or, you know, these different <clears throat> different things. And, the, and then the owner's super grateful because – you know, wow, that was taken care of. Yeah, you know, my vet tried these things. They knew when to send it, and then we got resolution. Um, that so that's usually the best time to see them is it, 
really sooner rather than later. One of my mentors used to say that, and then we got kind of, you know, haggled. But you know, he used to say it's always best to see him if if it's three or more times within a six month period. That's a fairly you, you've had three chances to try to like get this thing under control, and and maybe at, at least have another look at a different you know different set of eyes and and so forth to to make sure that we're on the same page or something else needs to be done yeah and chris you really made an important point i want to repeat and that is the fact that you had the choice to either involve someone like you a specialist or you risk them going to a a competitor in your area which honestly is a waste of their money in most instances right i mean it's better to go ahead and kick it up and so for me i i'm kind of like you there's like a, a three time rule and usually on the second time so if I'm seeing this dog, and let's face it, we all know there are certain breeds that are going to be a little more problematic, or, or it's just that specific case. If it's a really severe otitis externa, that right. second visit, I'm going to start to lay the, 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 the groundwork here and say, hey, look, you know, this, this, is a, this is a tough one. And, uh, you know, we want to make sure that Buster is, is feeling better as quickly as possible. So I'm going to try this approach today, but we're going to give it no more than another week or two weeks before I'm going to, I want you to reach out to a friend of mine. I'm going to connect you with uh, Dr. Chris Reeder, who's an exceptional dermatologist. I mean, those are the kind of conversations that can prevent them from then going for that third visit with your competitor. So I, I do think Vertical Vet Family, it's important, like Chris said, to go ahead and act earlier than later. Chris, as we sort of wrap up today's conversation, any other little last Last bits of advice, you know, things that you're seeing, trends that you want to make sure that we're aware of uh, that are happening in dermatology with otitis externa? Uh, really, I mean, I, I think that uh, you did a great job kind of moderating it and getting everything, keeping me on track as I tend to get off track quite, quite easily. But, uh, you know, I think everything you, you've done a, an excellent job at kind of summing everything up and uh, trying to keep it all in, in uh, a nice um uh, you know, a nice, uh, box here of what otitis externa is. It's frustrating. Okay. So I guess that's the point. Don't be worried. Uh, the folks that are out there who have cases, it is frustrating. It's frustrating for me. And sometimes we've got to go, you know, guns a blazing with all kinds of different concoctions, like a lot of dermatologists do. Um, and we do that based typically based on cultures and things. So, uh, you know, there's, um, it's difficult. I will tell you ears, ears and paws are very difficult to get under control. And a lot of times, um, one treatment, um, I will tell you is not necessarily going to, to cure it. Um, I would caution you to not just refill medications without examinations. It's really important to get them back in for a recheck once they've gone out the door Rechecks are a huge reason why we have treatment failures if they don't come back in and we don't know what's going on. Um, but also just not refilling medications chronically. When I was in general practice, we always had folks that would call and ask for another bottle of whatever it might be. And and I think we just kind of got complacent and said, yeah, sure, come pick it up. It worked the last time until it doesn't work. And then we're stuck. So, um, but uh yeah, if anybody needs help, I mean, definitely ha- happy to do that for you. That's great advice. And I love the fact of just don't refill medications just willy nilly because it will get you in trouble eventually. Yeah. Well, Dr. Chris Reeder, thank you so much uh, for spending time with us today. You can find out more about him at lighthousevetderm.com. Uh, he was here today on behalf of Verbac. And so we want to thank Verbac for being one of Vertical Vet's principal sponsors and partners because we get to bring amazing talent like uh, Chris to you today. So thank you again for being with us, Chris. Thank you. I appreciate it. Have a good afternoon. Well, thank you again to Verbac for sponsoring Dr. Reader. We really appreciate their uh, partnership and collaboration with Vertical Vet. If uh, you're new to the Vertical Vet family, this is the kind of content that we deliver, you know, every month or so. And so we are super glad to, to be able to, to do this for you. If there are topics that you want us to tackle, let us know. You can hit us up via email, messaging, however you want to do that. Uh, we really want you to share this with your team. So if you have young associates who maybe aren't as comfortable with otitis externa, externa this might be an excellent master class for them to take. Share it with your veterinary technician staff, your managers, your CSRs, because everybody needs to know how to better manage ear infections. And so again, I am Dr. Ernie Ward, Executive Director of Education for Vertical Vet. It has been my pleasure to spend this time with you today. Stay safe out there. Give your pets a hug for me. Bye.